good afternoon respected director registrar professor dr gauri devi ma'am professor dean pamela shah professor sanjeev sinha and the respected professors and respected invitees and dear students who have joined online we have all gathered online for the prestigious second dr gauri devi oration to express our admiration and love to professor gauri devi ma'am a great clinician par excellence who established the care for neuromuscular patients in nimhans and also a great teacher and researcher let us start today's program i invite our beloved director to deliver the welcome address thank you very much a very good afternoon to everyone and a good morning to professor dean pamela shaw our former director <laughs> beloved dr gauri devi um our former director dr satish chandra our former faculty of nimhans the current faculty staff and students and particularly the team from neurology the organizing committee for the oration and the luminary for today afternoon's talk professor dame pamela shaw i'm indeed delighted to welcome you all to this first oration of the year 2022 and the second dr m gauri devi oration this prestigious oration organized by the department of neurology at the national institute of mental health and neurosciences is a token of regard love and esteem for professor m gauri devi a very noted neurologist for her immense contribution to the field of neuromuscular diseases and other areas of neurology she started the dedicated neuromuscular clinic at nimhans strengthened the electrophysiological services and also several other testing facilities and she led research into various aspects of neuromuscular disorders as well as neuroepidemiology even after her superannuation from nimhans she continues to be very actively engaged in academics and research and she continues to inspire several generations of young neurologists the first dr m gauri devi oration was held in january 2019 and the oration was delivered by dr samir brahmachari uh, on his his topic was that evening at the dmd clinic at nimhans we changed the course of my very science and i'm sure the title itself indicates how much the neuromuscular clinic at nimhans has impacted people's lives it is very apt that the topic for today's discussion is again on motor neuron disease and the advances in understanding the pathophysiology of this disorder which has led to better treatment facilities for people with these disorders and we have the very esteemed professor dame pamela shaw in our midst she is an outstanding neurologist with over two decades of experience in the area and we are indeed honored to have her at today's oration i don't want to stand between you and her so thank you very much for being here thanks to all the participants who are online we'd have been delighted to have her in our midst in person but we'll probably have to wait for another occasion thank you madam dr gauri devi for raising the occasion and everyone else and i hand it back to the organizers thank you ma'am professor gauri devi is renowned worldwide for her contributions to the field of neurology and especially neuromuscular disorders many who have joined today might have been blessed to have her as their teacher her contributions are innumerable and she continues to astonish us with her academic endures i welcome dr netravati professor of neurology to give us a glimpse of gauri devi ma'am's journey in neurology thanks sina very good afternoon one and all teachers render us light and lead us to the pathway of life they seek nothing but respect in return to their persistent efforts to give the best 
They inspire us each day and make us strive towards the root of success. On this note, myself, Dr. Mitra, take it as an honor and a privilege in behalf of the Department of Neurology to introduce none other than our most beloved teacher, Professor M. Gaudi Devi, lovingly called as MGD Madam on this occasion of second Dr. M. Gaudi Devi oration. Madam, a doyen of neurology, born in December 1938 at Anakapalli, Vishakapatnam, she completed her MBBS with several gold medals, the best outgoing student in 1961 at Andhra Medical College. Madam initially opted for Menti course in pathology, inspired by her teachers and awards for distinction in pathology, which was actually given after a gap of 15 years. But destiny paved a different path and in less than two months, she chose internal medicine and subsequently DM Neurology at AIMS New Delhi and passed out in 1968. The award of Commonwealth Medical Fellowship in 1973 made her realize her dream of neuromuscular specialty at Newcastle General Hospital and Royal Free Hospital at London, where she was mentored by the giants of neurology like Sir John Walton and P.K. Thomas. In 1977, she joined our institute, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Nuhans, as associate professor. And after her long innings here, she retired as director of Nuhans in 2002. At Nimans, Professor Gauri Devi was entrusted with the responsibility of developing the specialty of neuromuscular disorders by Professor K.S. Mani, which she successfully achieved and brought it to great heights. The neuromuscular lab which she started with a Faraday cage, DISA EMG machine, Madam translated her overseas acquired knowledge and technology into a reality at Nimans. Her contribution to neurology is immense, unparalleled. Few of the jewels on Madam's crown include the work on leprosy, hyaluronidase injection in spinal arachnoiditis. Her passionate research on motor neuron disease is beyond exemplary. She did phenomenal work in monomelic amyotrophy and was instrumental in coining the term. In 1997, she was appointed as a director of Nimhans and she did great justice to this post as an able administrator. The greatest asset the convention center has been her brainchild. Professor Gauri Devi Madam has been honored with many scientific awards, to name a few, the Basanti Devi Amit Chand Prize, Dr. B.C. Roy Award, Om Prakash Basin Award, Kukulberg Award Lecture from International Federation of Clinical Neurophysiology, member of many national, international task force research organizations. I could go on and on, but for the shortage of time. Madam, in her autobiography, mentions the love, passion she has for Nimhans in these words. I retired from my karma bhumi in November 2002 with the satisfaction that Nimhans is one of the finest institutions. This speaks volumes of her love, passion, work, at Nimhans. After her retirement, she's presently based at Delhi as senior consultant neurologist and chairman of the Department of Clinical Neurophysiology at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Madam is one of the most distinguished, respected, admired neurologist and teacher of this country. It is with pride to introduce Professor Gauri Devi Madam, who has immensely contributed to Indian neurology. Madam, a salutations to you. Thank you. Thank you, Netra, ma'am, for that wonderful introduction. Listening to it was truly inspirational. Now, today we have an eminent neurologist, Professor Dale Pamela Shah from Sheffield Institute to render the oration. Her contributions to the care of patients with neuromuscular disorders and especially motor neuron disease is incredible. I request Professor Sanjeev Sinha, Professor and Head of the Department of Neurology, to kindly introduce the orator. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure on behalf of the Department of Neurology to introduce to you all Professor Dame Pamela Shaw. She is a senior British neurologist 
and professor of neurology at University of Sheffield. She is an outstanding neurologist and a clinical scientist. She has over 500 publications in peer-reviewed journals with an age index of 93 and 30,000 citations. She has supervised close to 50 PhD students and over the last 30 years, she had secured a grant of 60 million pounds. But these achievements and assessments undervalue the passion, care, and selfless approach by which her success has been achieved. She graduated from Newcastle University with numerous prizes and overall honors in 1979, and within two years completed the membership of Royal College. She pursued her MD in 1988 with neurological complications in coronary bypass surgery. Subsequently developed keen interest in neurology and over several decades, she has worked on neurological complications of thyroid disease. In fact, on motor neuron disease, she named the disease as the worst disease of, in medicine. She established a clinical and laboratory-based program of research in the field of MND. In 1991, she set up one of the first MND care centers supported by Motor Neuron Disease Association. She led definitive trial of non-invasive ventilation, which is most effective treatment for MND. She also was involved in Riluzol trial and many other compound trials in this uh, disease, which we are going to hear from her. In year 2000, she was the chair of neurology at University of Sheffield, eventually leading to the establishment of Seville Institute of Translational Neuroscience in 2010. She raised close to 20 million pounds for the facility of which half was from philanthropic donations from individuals often directly inspired by her. Since 2015, she has served as Pro Vice Chancellor of Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health at University of Sheffield. She has also had spearheaded a two million pound fundraising campaign to purchase a MR PET scanner. She is a lover of orchids and has many in her office and home. She enjoys swimming and riding her bike in Derbyshire countryside if you happen to be there with her husband, Paul. In 2014, Professor Pam Saw was honored by Her Majesty the Queen when she was made a Dame Commander of the Order of British Empire for her service to neuroscience. International ALS and MND Forbes Nordish Award for Excellence in Research and Compassion in Clinical Care. In 2019, she received the Association of British Neurologists Metallist. So, ladies and gentlemen, we Welcome, ma'am, once again on behalf of NIMANS, Department of Neurology, and the alumni of uh, NIMANS. Over to you for your deliberation. Thank you, sir. We are all waiting eagerly to listen to you, ma'am. Welcoming you. Thank you very much for that very kind um, introduction. Um, it's a great honor. Um, to be invited to give this second oration lecture in honor of Professor Gowri Devi, who I've met on several occasions, both in Newcastle and in Sheffield. Um, so it's lovely to be here. I'm only sorry that I can't be with you in person, but I would love to visit your institute one day. Um, so I'm just going to hope that the technology works and share my screen and put my slides up. Now then, can you see the slides there? Yes, okay. Yeah, I'll put it onto full screen. And let me just check that the slides change, yes. So, um, lovely to be here with you. There, there is, I see, a huge audience in honor of Professor Gary Devi, um, who is somebody that has always inspired me. Um, she was a lady neurologist, um, long before there were many lady neurologists, either in the UK or India or around the world. And, and she's been um, a real inspiration to me. And I think as, you, as I go through my lecture, 
you may see that our philosophy of life and philosophy of neurological care show some great similarities. So um, this wonderful lady, um, there's a, a beautiful picture of her there. Um, we've heard um, something about uh, her career, but I'm a very visual person. Um, so I thought I would just show some pictures of some of the seminal things that she has achieved during her long career in neurology. Um, so she was one of the first um, uh, to graduate in, in, the, in the first cohort of postgraduates in neurology in India from 1966 to 68. She's trained and mentored um, over a, more than 100 neurology trainees. And we have a lovely um, colleague in Sheffield, Dr. Siva Nair, who is one of her trainees. And he does a great job in rehabilitation neurology in, in Sheffield. Um, I think she's made um, really significant contributions to developing clinical neurology, but also neurophysiology and neuroepidemiology in India. Um, she introduced the term monomelic amyotrophy in 1984, and that term is used around the world. She's published more than 170 articles um, during her career. Um, so here are just some pictures. Uh, this is the EMG laboratory she established in 1979. Uh, she's um, entertained um, royalty uh, over her career. Here she is with the King and Queen of Nepal. Um, this is her hosting her mentor and teacher, Professor Baldev Singh in 1986. This is the Doppler laboratory um, she set up. And she's hosted international symposia uh, here is one that she hosted in um, 1984, which she organized. And if you look at the people in this picture, you can see many um, famous um, neurologists who come to attend. So Professor Hirano, uh, Wally Bradley here, um, many uh, eminent people um, came at the invitation of Professor Gary Devi. Um, she's um, promoted neuroepidemiology in Indi India at NIH in the US. This is a visit she and some of her colleagues made in 1989. And here she is with one of her mentors, who was also a mentor to me, uh, Sir John Walton, who uh, later became Lord Walton of Detchment. Um, and he, he had the pleasure of visiting Nyman's um, a good few years ago. Um, so um, I think you all, you're all very aware that the model of comprehensive care set up at Nyman's by Professor Gowri Devi um, is, is a real model of holistic care for patients with neuromuscular and motor neuron disorders uh, and very much aligned um, with how we like to care for patients in Sheffield. And this is, um, I think, just the expression on people's faces here at her farewell celebration in 2002, just show the love and respect and high esteem in which she has been held throughout her career. And um, uh, here are the five sequential directors of Nyman's with Professor Gary Devi as the lone tigress, <laughs> as someone named her uh, in, in the middle of that picture. And this is Professor Gary Devi visiting Sheffield in uh, 2015. She visited Citran, our research institute, which I'm going to show you in a minute. And here is Dr. Siva Nair, who's one of the <coughs> neurologists in Sheffield and who trained uh, under Professor Gary Devi and who comes to visit uh, Nyman's every time he's back in India. And these are just some of her seminal publications uh, that we heard about earlier, um, really um, famous for her description of monomelic amyotrophy, um, which is a very nice diagnosis um, to make in patients with a, a motor neuron disorder. 
um, but also um, contributions beyond that really, particularly in terms of um, the neuroepidemiology of neurological disorders in India. So it's a great honor for me to uh, give this oration lecture in, in honor of such a distinguished um, and well-loved lady neurologist. So many of you will not have come across or met me before. So I thought I would just introduce myself a little bit. So I'm director of this lovely institute called CITRAN, the Sheffield Institute for Translational Neuroscience. And here is the building at dawn, at midday and at midnight, where we beaver away trying to understand the causes of motor neuron disease and most importantly, develop better treatments um, for patients. And uh, we have the honor of hosting a visit by Professor Gauri Devi in 2015. Um, I was trained in neurology in Newcastle, um, where I think Professor Gary Devi also did uh, an attachment there. Uh, so this is where I trained right on the far right side of this picture is myself as a resident in, in neurology. And you can see um, in this picture, many um, British neurologists and neurosurgeons um, that you may well have come across with Lord Walton sitting in the middle there of the front row. Um, so the vice chancellor in Sheffield headhunted myself and my husband, Paul, who's a neuropathologist to come uh, to take up chairs of neurology and neuropathology in Sheffield. He had a bee in his bonnet about neuroscience and he wanted really to establish strong academic neurology in, in Sheffield. So he persuaded me that I could do more for MND if I moved from the excellent center in Newcastle. And so we moved to Sheffield in 2000, uh, initially to the medical school and the neurology department is in the Royal Hallamshire Hospital in Sheffield. A lot of people think of Sheffield as a, as a gray steel making city, but actually it's the greenest city in the UK and also the safest city. So full of lovely, friendly um, people, the people of, of Sheffield are very nice indeed. And I live um, in uh, about 14 miles southwest of Sheffield in the Peak District, which is a beautiful um, park, um, public park um, with, with lovely um, green hills to walk and climb in. So my passion has been motor neuron disease, sometimes known as ALS. Um, and I got interested in it when I was training in neurology in Newcastle, because I really did think it was just about the worst disease in medicine. It always seemed to happen to the nicest of people. And we, it made me feel like a useless doctor. So we knew nothing about what caused it. Um, we did very little to help patients or their families in those days. So some perverse instinct made me decide to dedicate my life in neurology to trying to improve the outcome of this condition. So you're all very aware that MND is the commonest neurodegenerative disorder of midlife. Its prevalence in Europe is um, somewhere between six to nine per hundred thousand. People think of it as a relatively rare disease um, but it's only rare-ish in the population because it's so, its prognosis is so poor. Um, so people don't live very long with this condition. But the lifetime risk is somewhere around one in 350 people. I see as many new MND patients as my colleagues in the multiple sclerosis clinic see new patients, but they have more patients on their books because uh, of, of the poor prognosis of MND with life expectancy only two to three years on average. Um, somewhere around 10% of patients will have a family history of MND and most people have symptoms for about 12 months before they reach the neurology clinic for the diagnosis. 
So we're all aware of this beautiful motor neuron system um, uh, that, that we have with cell bodies in the brain, brainstem and spinal cord, and the, then this, this network of motor axons coming out of the central nervous system into the peripheral nerves. They're amazing cells, I think, with amazing properties. So the cell body sitting in the lower spinal cord may have an axon a meter in length to contact um, muscles in the distal part of the lower limbs. So if you imagine that cell body as the size of a tennis ball, then the axon would be two kilometers in length. So very uh, amazing cells, I think, with very special properties. And I'll just show you, as, as neurologists, I'm sure you're all aware of this, but ju just show you this video, which hopefully will work, as to why um, I, I, this is such a terrible disease for patients and their families. So this is a gentleman with advanced MND. He was fit and well and indeed an athlete until two years before this. And in the late stages of MND, um, he's almost paralyzed. So no movement in his arms and legs. It takes three people to stand him up. Uh, he's got a gastrostomy tube. He's actually got tracheostomy ventilation, um, but can still move his eyes. So the uh, motor neurons supplying the extra ocular muscles are um, much less susceptible in this disorder. And you can see the intelligence in his eyes and he controls his computer with eye gaze. So a really terrible disease for rapidly progressive paralysis like that to happen to a person. So how do we set about improving the outcome for patients with MND? And there are some issues that we have to bear in mind. And one of the big issues, I think, is the heterogeneity of MND. So we've, tried, we've tended to treat it in clinical trials as though it's one thing. But we know now that it's heterogeneous clinically, genetically, pathologically, and prognostically. And monomelic amyotrophy is one example of such heterogeneity. And in future clinical trials, we need to take this into account as we're evaluating patients. So this is just to illustrate the clinical heterogeneity. So some patients have classical ALS as described by Jean-Martin Charcot, but um, patients can present with segmental syndromes progressive bulbar palsy, flail arm syndrome, flail leg syndrome. Some people have uh, predominantly upper motor neuron syndromes, primary lateral sclerosis, or predominantly lower motor neuron syndromes, progressive muscular atrophy. And some patients have concomitant frontotemporal dementia. So it's clearly clinically heterogeneous. And it's also genetically heterogeneous. So the first gene found to cause familial MND back in 1993 is copper zinc superoxide dismutase, SOD1. Um, the commonest gene we now know to cause, which can cause both MND and frontotemporal dementia is c 9 orf 72 So in the UK, about 10% of patients overall will have a change in that C9 gene. And with the advances in sequencing technology and big consortia being set up to uh, bring together DNA samples from lots and lots, thousands of patients, then there's been a real explosion in um, the number of genes that have been found that can predispose motor neurons to injury. And there are at least 40 robust genes that have now been found. And new genes are appearing all the time. Um, these are just some ones that my team in Sheffield have been involved with. So GLT8D1, TBK1, DNAJC7, KIF5A, which was known as a cause of hereditary spastic paraplegia, NEC1, and so on. So um, we're, we're really powering up now to genetically um, subclassify the disorder. My husband, as I explained, is a neuropathologist, so I always have to show this slide. We know now that most 
MND is a TDP43 proteinopathy, 97% of cases. And this here on the left-hand side is a normal motor neuron stained for TDP43. And you can see that that protein is normally largely located in the nucleus of the cell, but it shuttles between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And as the motor neurons are becoming injured in MND, there is loss of TDP43 from the nucleus, and it accumulates in aggregates in the cytoplasm that may be compact or skein-like in morphology. And as luck would have it, the first gene, SOD1, is not a TDP43 proteinopathy. So patients with SOD1 mutations do get protein aggregates, in, their, in the motor neurons as they're becoming injured, but they do not contain the TDP43 protein. And the commonest genetic subtype is a, a TDP43 proteinopathy, but these patients get additional protein aggregates that are not stained with an antibody to TDP43. So they get these extra um, protein aggregates that you can show up with stains for P62, but are TDP43 negative. And these are formed by the, the, the abnormal hexanucleotide expansion in C9 um, causes the production of toxic dipeptide repeat proteins. And that's what these non-TDP43 aggregates are. So pathologically heterogeneous as well, and also prognostically heterogeneous. So in the US, um, MND is sometimes called Lou Gehrig's disease. He was a Yankee um, stadium baseball player who had the best home run average ever. Um, and he had fast, relatively fast progressing MND. He died uh, within two years of the first symptom, which affected his right hand. And the first sign that he was developing a problem was when he couldn't hit the baseball as far. Um, and if you see a good quality image of this picture, you can see the wasting of his right hand that is starting there. But others like Stephen Hawking, who was very disabled um, at, at the end of his life, but he kept it at bay for more than 50 years. So it, it first started when he was in his 20s and he died in his 70s. Um, from ALS, so prognostically heterogeneous. And we also know from years of studying, so what goes wrong when a patient has a mutation in the SOD1 gene? And you would think we would have solved SOD1 MND by now um, because it's a well-known protein, it's a free radical scavenging enzyme, but we now know that when there is a, a, an amino acid change in SOD1, it's not just one thing that goes wrong. At least 11 um, disease mechanisms contribute to the motor neuron injury and cell death. And it involves not only the motor neurons, but the surrounding um, glial cells as well, the astrocytes and microglia, and their crosstalk with motor neurons also um, becomes impaired or, or damaged as MND develops. So the pathophysiology is complex. So how do we um, try and improve outcomes for this um, very distressing disease? And I think this, this outlines my strategy here. And I think there, there is definite crosstalk with Professor Gary Debbie's approach um, to her patients as well. So the first thing I felt we needed to do was to create the right research infrastructure. We needed multidisciplinary care and improved symptom management. So not just neurologists, but other healthcare professionals helping with these patients, nurses, physios, dietitians, et cetera. We need, like has been done in um, branches of oncology, so we don't treat breast cancer now as just one thing. It is divided into its molecular subtypes, and we need to do the same with MND. We need to subclassify the condition better. We need to use, harness neuroscience 
to develop new strategies for neuroprotection. And we also need to bring along the next generation of researchers. So these are the five principles on which, um, which I have used to try and do something about uh, the worst disease in medicine. So let's talk about the infrastructure, first of all. So we created Citran, which I've already shown you. Um, and this started with, so we were, uh, our research group was in the medical school in Sheffield, and it started with a patient who said to me, if you had 20 million pounds to devote to MND research, what would you do with it? <laughs> and I thought this was a lighthearted, jokey conversation. Um, I, you know, I had no experience of fundraising. I wouldn't dream in a million years that we could raise that amount of money for MD. But I thought about it and I said what I would do, I described Citran basically. And she said, this patient said to me, well, I'm going to help you do that. You go away and write a brochure about the vision for this institute and I will help you raise the money to create it. And she did help me. We had a group of patrons who raised 12 million pounds and then the university made a contribution and the government made a contribution. So we raised the money needed. And we, we had the great honor of um, Her Majesty the Queen and Prince Philip opening the building for us in, in 2010. And it's surprisingly unusual, this building, because quite, we, we designed it deliberately so that we could do something about MND. We also have teams that work on other neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, um, uh, Alzheimer's and the aging brain, multiple sclerosis, but we designed it around motor neuron disease and it was MND patients that helped us raise the funding. And one thing that um, is unusual about it is that we have multidisciplinary teams of scientists and academic clinicians, here's Dr. Dom, Tom Jenkins, in the same building and talking to each other. And the idea is, the vision of it, is to harness advances in neuroscience and translate those into benefits for, for patients with neurological disorders where we feel we can make a difference, including, of course, motor neuron disease. So I had, it was a dream for me to be able to design the laboratories in Citran and um, we, we made sure, I think if you're a dedicated genetics or biochemistry lab, you might get so far and then you'll get stuck. So we have um, specialist laboratories with specialist scientific teams within them. So neuropathology, neurobiology, neurogenetics, molecular biology, we've all had to become RNA biologists. We have a functional genomics lab, which is named in honor of Professor John Newsom Davis, who sadly lost his life in a car accident when he was examining a PhD in Romania a few years ago. So we have all these different um, specialist scientific laboratories with skilled teams within them, and they all feed into our drug discovery suite and our gene therapy suite. So what we're trying to do is understand the mechanisms of motor neuron injury, find potential therapeutic targets, and then develop them, those targets, into potential treatments for patients. The other very special, so this is the preclinical workhorse, if you like, Citran, but across the road in the hospital, we're linked to a biomedical research center, which is funded by NIHR, and that is dedicated to experimental medicine in neurology. So the idea is we pull through discoveries from Citran into experimental medicine with patients in the hospital and hopefully um, try and improve outcomes for patients. And one of the good things about unraveling the genetic causes of MND is that it allows you to model the disease in the laboratory. So we use cellular models, we use um, fruit fly, um, zebrafish and mouse models of the disease with human uh, genetic changes within them, but the models are not perfect and we always have to link them back to human biosamples. 
So we have a large brain tissue bank. 220 patients have donated their tissue very generously at the end of their illness. And these days, one of the really exciting things is that we can take a small sliver of skin and convert those fibroblasts into the cells of interest within the nervous system. So we can make them into motor neurons and astrocytes. Some specialties within medicine, if you're a dermatologist or a hepatologist, you can take a piece of the tissue with the disease you're studying and study it in the laboratory. Obviously we can't take biopsies of a patient's brain and spinal cord, but now this reprogramming technology allowing us to make skin cells from patients into the cells that are relevant in MND is a really exciting step forward. Uh, this is Laura Ferrariolo, one of my um, best PhD students. She was, she's now become a professor and she specializes in this um, reprogramming of fibroblasts. So we use the Yamanaka factors to make those skin cells into motor neurons, astrocytes, microglia. And of course, we can take the genetic subtypes of MND, but we can also take it, take cells from sporadic ALS patients where we haven't yet identified a genetic cause. Um, we can use fruit flies. So Ryan West is a very bright young fellow who puts MND genes into fruit flies. He has ways of monitoring the motor function of fruit flies. Um, he, um, this is the movement of the proboscis of, of the fruit fly, and you can detect um, the, the, the fruit fly on the right has a C9 off mutation, and you can see the motor function of that proboscis is not working properly. So uh, you can get amazing um, uh, insights from the fruit fly. If you put an MND gene into the fruit fly, you can see the neurodegenerative process by black changes that happen um, in, in the eye of the fruit fly. So the eye of the fruit fly is a very good way of screening potential therapies. And this is one of the genetic therapies that we've been using in C9. And you can see applying that genetic therapy removes all that neurodegenerative change from the fruit fly. Zebrafish, so our guru of zebrafish work is uh, Tenor Ramesh who's from India originally. He's a veterinary scientist and he's developed very elegant um, zebrafish models of uh, motor neuron disease. You can test their motor function in, uh, in this, um, it's like a, a, a zebrafish um, treadmill. So the fish swims against the current. He also can use uh, molecular biology to put a special dye into the, the um, fruit fly so that as the motor neurons are becoming injured, they glow red. And so you end up with this um, heat shock response that shows you the early proteinopathy that's developing. And we use those glowing red zebrafish again to screen for potential neuroprotective therapies. We also use mouse models. So Richard Mead is the lead for mouse models and we measure um, motor neuron disease in mice in various ways, including a mouse treadmill called the rotor rod. We can measure paw prints, um, stride length, and that sort of thing. And we have a neuroscoring assessment of the mice. So we have mice with SOD1, TDP43, and C9 mutations. So um, that's creating the infrastructure the laboratory infrastructure, the interested clinicians, and the scientific skills to try and learn more about MND and identify therapies. Multidisciplinary care, though, as you clearly know in uh, Nyman's, is, is really important. It's not just the neurologist that the patient needs to see. And we have a, a multidisciplinary team. And we showed a few years ago that that multidisciplinary team, if, if a patient comes to see a multidisciplinary team shown by the survival curve in orange, they do much better than patients attending a standard um, neurological cl clinic. So 
the average survival is improved by nine months and the mortality at one year reduced by about 30%. And this effect, it's an X factor, it's independent of whether the patient has gastrostomy, non-invasive ventilation, Rilluzole, et cetera. So having an, an MDT we think is very important. And what we've done is take, um, that there was a surprising lack of evidence for many of the interventions that we would use to try and improve symptoms. Um, it, it was based on expert opinion rather than scientific evidence. And what we've done from Citran um, is really take the symptoms that trouble patients one by one and try to do something more about them, improve uh, the quality of care by addressing those symptoms more robustly, but also provide the evidence base for what works and what doesn't work. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. And uh, my younger colleagues, uh, Professor Chris McDermott and Dr. E Esther Hobson, are really taking this forward in a very um, uh, energetic way at the moment. But I'll just show you some of the evidence. So we, I started when I was still in Newcastle actually <clears throat> addressing the problem of weakness of the respiratory muscles. Um, this, this is important because that's what patients usually die of. Um, so just like any other skeletal muscle, the, the um, diaphragm and intercostal muscles can lose their motor neuron supply in MND. And we showed, I, I engaged respiratory physicians in Newcastle to get interested in this problem. And one of the first things we showed is that quality of life measured here by general health perception is very highly correlated with how good your breathing muscles are. So if your respiratory function goes down, your well-being and quality of life goes down dramatically. I was nervous about intervening with non-invasive ventilation, worrying, are we just prolonging an awful illness or are we doing some good for the patient? And one of the other early things we showed is that when um, blood gases are beginning to be deranged, the patient is going into type two neuromuscular respiratory failure. If you intervene with non-invasive ventilation, the quality of life goes up dramatically. And interestingly, it stays up even though the motor problems are continuing to progress. So it really does um, improve quality of life. And it was a couple of patients um, who had this intervention early on who convinced me that it was worth um, trying to generate the evidence so that patients could have this intervention if they wished. So we did this difficult trial, started in, in, in Newcastle, um, which did, it was published in Lancet Neurology. This is the NIV setup, so a mask that usually the patient just uses it when they go to bed at night, at least initially. And we provided the evidence that um, this intervention improved not only quality of life, but actually life expectancy. Um, so that uh, has now been approved as a nice guideline. It's standard practice now in the UK and worldwide, but it only became so when we provided the um, clinical trial evidence that the intervention was effective. Another troublesome problem is weakness of the neck muscles. If you put your chin onto your chest and hold it there for any length of time, you will see how uncomfortable that is. And when you're, you've got this head drop, very difficult to communicate because you can't look people in the eye properly. You get a lot of pain and discomfort in the neck. And it also makes eating at mealtimes difficult. So we decided to try and do something about that problem. And the existing collars are not very good for MND patients. They're either too soft and flop, floppy, or they're designed to immobilize the neck, say, after a road traffic accident, and they're not comfortable for patients. And your head is surprisingly heavy. It weighs about five kilograms. So we set up a multidisciplinary team to design 
a new collar that met the patient's needs. And we had input from very much patients and family members helped us to de design the collar. Um, and we had all sorts of people helping us. So as well as patients, we had bioengineers, material scientists, even fashion designers uh, helped us design the appropriate collar. And Chris McDermott, my colleague, uh, led this program. And so with the help of all these people, we designed um, the head up collar, um, which is now uh, available throughout the NHS in the UK, but also worldwide. Um, and patients really like it and it's adaptable. You can put extra support onto the collar um, if, if your neck is worse at one side than the other, or if you need extra support, for example, when you're traveling by car or the bumpy roads, um, et cetera. So, and, and the material is breathable, so it's, it, it's quite comfortable. The material was actually designed by um, NASA. So the head up collar, um, again, is um, helping a troublesome symptom that patients have. So what about the molecular? How can we improve the subclassification of MND? So we recently um, published this study in JNNP, um, and I'll explain about it. So supported by the MND Association, we have this program called Ambrosia, which allows us to take biosamples from all newly diagnosed ALS patients. And it's a three center study in Sheffield, Oxford and UCL in London. Uh, and we're collecting samples from 600 ALS patients and we're almost there with that. So every patient and all the patients are so keen to contribute to research, they all say yes when we ask them, would they help with this study? So we take blood in all its forms. So plasma, serum, uh, um, white blood cells, uh, DNA, RNA, et cetera, urine, cerebrospinal fluid, and we take a sliver of skin to reprogram the fibroblast that I showed you before. And as part of this study, all um, patients, whether, whether or not they have a family history, are screened for the known genetic variants. So we screened a panel of 44 genes that can cause both MND and frontotemporal dementia and other neurodegenerative disorders. I won't go in the interest of time into the way we did the um, genetic screening, but it was using basically um, next generation sequencing on an Illumina platform. And of, we just published the results on the first prospectively collected 100 patients. And of those, 7% had a family history of MND. So that's within the 5 to 10% that you would expect. But when we analyzed the genetic results on a research basis, we actually found that 21% had a clinically reportable pathogenic mutation in one of the known genes. And another 21% had a, a variant that we had to say was of uncertain significance, but it was after um, benign variants had been removed and any variant that was common in the control population. So many of these gene changes are also likely to be pathogenic. So I think it's going to come through now that we at least offer patients um, genetic screening if they would like to have it done. So these, um, this first 100 patients, um, the most common gene changes, as you would expect, are in C9 and SOD1, but we found a variety of other genes as well. And this table just shows that, um, so C9, SOD1, but other changes in Alcin, Fig4, neurofilament heavy, um, et cetera. So, I think that's the first step in the molecular classification of MND. So I think we're in a very exciting phase for um, uh, genetic therapies for MND. And I think spinal muscular atrophy really has led the way. Um, so the very exciting results that have emerged from either um, altering the splicing of the SMN gene or gene replacement 
using AAV viral vectors has really um, is really making a huge difference to um, at least babies with the Verdnig Hoffman severe type of SNA. Um, and can we apply that to um, gene changes in ALS? Well, we've started with the SOD1 gene, um, which um, was the first gene um, to be described causing familial ALS. Um, it's a very well-known gene with a well-known function. So it's a free radical scavenger and the protein molecules come together as a dimer and the superoxide radicals are um, dismutated uh, within the active channel of that protein dimer. That um, protein is very abundant in the nervous system. So about 1% of brain protein is SOD1. And we know from genetic engineering in mice that you can knock out the SOD1 gene with relative impunity, not complete impunity, but relative impunity. And we also know from years of studying SOD1 mutations that just like I showed you before, the process of motor neuron injury is complicated. Lots of things go wrong. At the moment, we only have one drug, Rilizol, which has some effect in protecting from glutamate excited toxicity. Not surprising that that effect is modest, prolonging survival by only three or four months when all these other damaging mechanisms are left unchecked. So for a simple-minded neurologist like me, how could we do better? We either need a drug or a cocktail of drugs that tackle several of these damaging mechanisms, but perhaps we could go right upstream and knock down the expression of the gene that's causing the problem. So there've been really exciting preclinical developments for SOD1 knockdown. This is just the study we did from Sheffield. So we used AAV9 um, to carry an inhibitory RNA into the nervous system. And um, you can see that the untreated mice in blue uh, get progressive neurological disability from their neuroscore. The treated mice in red do not. Survival curves much better in the treated mice. Um, so, and importantly, you can demonstrate that you're lowering the level of the SOD1 protein in the cerebrospinal fluid of the mice. So this um, we felt could be an important biomarker in human treatment trials. I won't show you all the data, but good evidence that you're preserving the health of motor neurons with that genetic therapy approach. And here is just a video of sibling mice born in the same litter. This one running around looking like a normal mouse has been treated with the genetic therapy. Its brother, um, the control mice you can see, has developed motor neuron disease. So very compelling preclinical results that this might be an approach to try in human patients. And indeed, it has been tried in human patients. So not using a viral vector to deliver the SOD1 knockdown, but using antisense oligonucleotides called, this one's called tofersin and sponsored by Biogen. So the phase two results <clears throat> of this genetic therapy trial were published in the New England Journal in 2020. And what the antisense oligonucleotide does, it binds to the messenger RNA, uh, in this case, SOD1, messenger RNA, and that binding causes enzymatic degradation by RNAs H so that you're lowering the, the level of the SOD1 protein. I won't go into all the details of the trial, but in the phase two trial, uh, 50 participants with SOD1 mutations, um, seven of whom were from our center in Sheffield. This was phase one, first into man, um, so starting very gently with a low dose, making sure that's safe in six patients around the world. And then if um, the safety committee give the green light, going up to higher and higher doses. And, and really the exciting results came from the highest 100 milligram dose. And I'll just show you some of the key results. So if you concentrate on the orange line, which is the 100 milligram dose, 
Here you can see the level of the SOD1 protein coming down nicely um, in the cerebrospinal fluid. But really importantly as well, um, we've now learned that measuring neurofilament proteins in either CSF or blood seems to be a good biomarker of therapeutic efficacy. So again, in the orange line, the orange group receiving the 100 milligram dose, the initially high level of neurofilament proteins coming down, whereas in the control group, um, the levels going up. So um, this is, it has had us really excited because that's what we need in clinical trials for MMD. In MS, you can measure inflammatory lesions with MRI scans. In MND, we haven't had a good biomarker, but it looks as though measuring <clears throat> neurofilament levels and also the relevant protein, if you're trying to knock down or upregulate a particular protein, measuring that is going to be important. This phase one trial was not powered to demonstrate clinical efficacy, but again, if you look at the orange treatment line, the ALS functional rating scale remaining stable, breathing monk, uh, function remaining pretty stable compared to the placebo group, handheld dynamometry muscle strength remaining pretty stable. And the FDA was so impressed with these phase two results, they said, just do your phase three with more patients on the 100 milligram dose. And the um, phase three results um, of this trial are just emerging now and they're complex. Um, and I won't, I, perhaps you may want to ask questions about it. I, I won't go into that now. And there are other genetic therapies ongoing as well. So antisense oligonucleotides for C9, um, two different companies doing that. Um, we're now starting uh, a, a study of pre-symptomatic patients who carry an, a, an SOD1 mutation. So some patients, if they know there's a SOD1 mutation in the family, they want to know if they have that change. So they have pre-symptomatic testing when they're fit and well. Those patients are going to be followed up. And as soon as their neurofilament levels in blood begin to rise, we will then intervene with the therapy. We already know from mouse studies that the early, earlier you intervene, the better. And there is also um, a genetic therapy trial of ataxin 2 knockdown, which has been shown in preclinical models to improve TDP43 proteinopathy. So genetic therapy, there are also some developments um, in small molecule therapy, and I won't go into everything, um, but uh, perhaps just to highlight the Amelix trial, um, which combined sodium phenylbutyrate with um, Tudka toro urso um, diol. Um, and the idea is that that's um, a two-pronged approach to reduce endoplasmic reticulum stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. And this trial was led um, by Merit Sikovitz in, in Boston. And the phase two results, which were also published in the New England Journal, showed some positive indicators. So the, the, the patients were treated over a six month period and um, the treated group declined on the ALS functional rating scale by minus 1.24 whereas the placebo group declined more. Um, so some evidence that it might be slowing the change in disability. And um, a, a further outcome from this trial, which was published in Muscle and Nerve just recently, showed that um, the patients who were originally treated in, in that trial compared to the placebo group that, that could then go on to open label at the end of the experimental period, um, there, there was actually a 6.5 month improvement in survival in the treated group. So there are ongoing discussions with the regulatory authorities uh, as to whether that therapy will be licensed now, um, but there's also a phase three trial going on to confirm those results. Another exciting approach, I think. So a lot of work from Stan Appel 
showed that in MND patients, the, the number of T regulatory lymphocytes and the function of those white blood cells are decreased in MND. And um, T regs um, can get into the nervous system and dampen down the neuroinflammation that we think contributes to motor neuron injury. So there are a number of approaches trying to boost um, the T reg. Um, number and function in ALS patients and therefore lower the um, balance of neuroinflammation. And I'll just show you, um, so there's been a European trial using low dose interleukin-2, which is known to increase Treg numbers and it's been used in other autoimmune conditions in the past. And the, this um, is, is the way we ought to be doing trials, embedding experimental medicine, learning from every patient. So the initial trial called Imodels was conducted in France. So it was only a three month um, treatment um, looking to ensure the safety of low dose IL-2 uh, and also establish the best dose. And in that study, they showed that particularly the higher dose, the 2 million international unit dose, um, dramatically increased the Treg numbers, but also lowered the level of um, uh, an inflammatory marker known as MCP1 or CCL2, as it's now known. So good evidence that the higher dose might do some good. Um, we did some... Um, transcriptome analysis. So we took the white blood cells from patients in that trial. We classified the patients into high responders and low responders based on the Treg count. And then we looked at the gene expression profile of the white blood cells. I, I won't go into all the detail, but basically uh, what we found is that based on the baseline gene expression profile in white blood cells, you could divide the patients into high responders and low responders. And the, um, all patients got a sharp down regulation of genes in pro-inflammatory pro pathways, but the, the ones that showed a less good response had a much more inflammatory phenotype based on their gene expression at baseline. So following on from that um, early study establishing parameters and the right dose and so on, uh, there, there has been a Myrocal's trial involving 220 um, patients in France and the UK. Um, the patients were treated for 18 months um, and there was embedded uh, experimental medicine in this trial with biomarker analysis at intervals and so on. And we're waiting with bated breath to get the results of that trial. They're being analyzed as we speak. So hopefully they will come out very soon. So what about how do we identify new targets? And I'm not going to go into this in detail in the interests of time, but ones we've been working on from Citran are NRF2 activators and knockdown of um, uh, a nuclear export factor called SRSF1 in C9 patients. I won't go into all the details, but happy to answer questions. So what we try to do within Citram, if you, if you think of the stages of drug development from target identification through all the screening that you need to do in cell and animal models, um, then um, uh, eventually arriving at early phase proof of concept in, in man. So we try to have a pipeline of therapies coming through. SOD1 gene silencing has obviously got through into human trials. And at the right stage, um, many pharmaceutical and biotech companies have wanted to join forces with us to bring those treatments through. So um, small molecule activators of NRF2 and SRSF1 gene therapy approaches are two of the things we're working hard on at the moment. And I'll just tell you a little bit about NRF2 because I, I think it's a very important transcription factor. 
So normally NR of two is held in the cytoplasm of the cells by this protein called Kiat one When the cell is under stress, NR of two gets released, travels into the nucleus and upregulates a whole host of neuroprotective genes. Um, so we all know about apoptosis, the programmed cell, light, uh, cell death pathway. NRF2, is, this, this pathway is sometimes known as the programmed cell life pathway. And there is evidence in MND that this stress response system, which should be operating fully, is not working properly. So we've tried to find small molecules that activate that transcription factor. And if we found such an effective drug, I showed you the only um, target we're hitting at the moment with Rilizol is excited toxicity. If we had an effective NRF2 activator, we would be able to protect all the points of damage shown by these green arrows. So we've developed, we did drug screening in our laboratories. We identified it as a target using gene expression profiling. We then screened libraries of drugs. We came up with the best hit called M102. That's got orphan drug des designation by the EMA, but also the FDA now. And we're working with a company called Eclipse Therapeutics. And we now have funding from the Medical Research Council and also a charity called Fight MND in Australia to do all the stages of taking that NRF2 activator into human trials so that we hope that first in human studies will happen in the next six months. One other thing to just briefly mention is, is we're now learning from what works very well in oncology and we're developing platform trials so there's one called TRICALS, which involves centers in the UK and also in Europe. Um, and, and we're bringing together specialist MD centers to set up these platform trials. And I won't, so there are 42 centers across 15 countries involved at the moment. We're trying to streamline trial design so that we can um, test several potential neuro neuroprotective agents at once with one placebo group, so making the most efficient use of um, placebo, uh, refining um, trial design so that more patients can take part in trials. MND patients are desperate to take part in, in trials by and large, but many of them are excluded because of restrictive inclusion criteria. So it will be more open to more patients and we will have innovative biomarkers so that we can do the trials more quickly and more nimbly. And we're just getting started with um, TRICALS now. And there's another trial called MND SMART, which is led from Edinburgh, that at the moment is testing memetine and trazodone, again with a common placebo group and really with very wide open inclusion criteria. Um, so lots of patients can take part in those trials. And these platform trials, um, you know, with, with um, uh, testing, uh, futility testing, so that you stop an ineffective treatment at an early stage and move on to test something else. Uh, th that sort of approach has been used very successfully in oncology. So I know that Professor Gauri Devi has um, mentored and inspired so many um, of India's neurologists. Um, I think I share with her um, enthusiasm um, for um, mentoring and training both young clinicians and scientists. So I have had 56 PhD students so far. Um, I'm delighted to say some of these have come from India. So Rohini, Sandeep, Anushka are all from the Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to um, take them through their PhDs and their scientific and clinical careers. All the um, uh, PhD students outlined in the red boxes are neurologists now, some of them professors of neurology. Um, so I very much share uh, Professor Gauri Devi's um, passion for bringing on the next generation of researchers. 
here are just some of the Citran teams um, standing outside the stainless steel, it has to be stainless steel, of course, in Sheffield, uh, letters of Citran. And I think also something that Professor Gowrie Devi has inspired is that you need to have fun as you go along. You're working on the worst disease in medicine, but you, you have to have some inspiration and fun as you go along. And I'll just show you one aspect of fun. So <laughs> you'll remember the ice bucket challenge. And um, I, I was interviewing in Leeds and I was supposed to come and lead the ice bucket challenge with all the people from Citran having icy water thrown over them. And my <laughs> train was delayed. I missed the train and everybody believed I deliberately missed the train. So I didn't have to have icy water uh, thrown over me. <laughs> Every my lab manager led um, the, the, the big program. Everyone had the icy water and I was shamed um, that they, I was being teased that, oh, you, you missed it. So I had to do it. And I thought, I can't do it alone. So I asked the vice chancellor of the University of Sheffield, Sir Keith Burnett, and the chief executive of Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, Sir Andrew Cash, if they would keep me company. And I thought they would say, you know, they're very dignified gentlemen. I thought they might say no, but to my delight, they said yes. And so we had the ice bucket challenge together. <laughs> I love this picture, the, the look of, stoical resignation on this vice chancellor's face <laughs> he gets the icy water thrown over him and the look of delight on professor mcdermott's face as he showers the chief executive of the hospital um, so we have great fun in citran as as well as doing hard work to try and improve um, the life and the outcomes for patients facing mnd and other neurological disorders. So just to conclude, um, the, the upstream genetic cause of MND can be identified somewhere between 21 and 42% of patients. 70% of those who have a family history, we will be able to find the gene now. There are clearly more genes to be found and MND has a rare variant architecture. It's not a common variant architecture. I think I really believe that new clinical trial approaches need to take account of this heterogeneity of MND and embed experimental medicine and biomarkers into the trials. I'm very excited that biomarkers of therapeutic efficacy are beginning to emerge from recent trials uh, and neurofilament levels in CSF and, um, CSF and plasma look very promising. Um, I'm so pleased that carefully conducted preclinical work is now beginning to translate into positive clinical trial results, and there will be more to come in the next few years, I'm quite sure. Genetic therapy approaches are now emerging, mm -hmm. SOD1 gene silencing, um, and uh, trials that there is still some more work to be done in terms of using AAV9 viral vectors, and we've got a big a European program called RDAT to address some of the immunological um, and side effect problems that can happen with AAV9 viral vectors. Uh, and I'm optimistic that new clinical trials platforms will allow greater access for patients and more rapid generation of results. We need to move away from survival studies that take two years um, to conduct. So I think I'm, I'm always, I always try to be a glass half full person, but I'm very gla glass half full about the future for this worst disease in medicine. But I'm also very aware that from the point of view of patients and families facing this disease, the pace of science and medicine does seem rather slow. So thank you very much. Um, for listening to me. Um, it's, a, it's a huge honor to deliver this um, lecture. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, ma'am. It was wonderful listening to you. You took us through the entire journey, highlighting the complexities in uh, the treatment of these patients, starting from the heterogeneity about biomarkers, and also how to analyze each symptom 
and help in making the life of these patients better and about the newer advances in the form of gene therapy. It was really wonderful listening to you. And I'm sure each one of us who have joined today have gained more knowledge and will be able to take better care of patients with motor neuron disease. And we hope to see more advances in this field in the coming years under guidance of eminent persons like you, ma'am, and hope that sometime in future, the life may not be as bleak for motor neuron disease patients. From being called the worst disease in medicine, it somehow may hold more promises in life for them. Let us all hope for that day. And now, may I request Gauri Devi, madam, to speak a few words. <clears throat> well, it was a really, one cannot express the uh, oration which Professor Pamela Shaw delivered, you know, bringing in hope and the silver lining to that dark clouds, as it were. And your last sentence was very important that patients think that we are very slow in delivering the research. What you pointed out, the heterogeneity has been a worrying issue. And across countries, even ethnic differences, like we found slightly um, longer survival periods. Maybe our patients were young in India, 40s, but there may be some other reasons, perhaps the genetics. We have just started entering that field of genetics, very few studies have been done. But the way you have talked about the platforms, I think that sounds very interesting. And uh, coming from oxidative stress to mitochondrial to neuroinflammation, I think whole range of um, etiopathogenesis is involved here. We look forward to a lot more from your center and across the world. I would like to thank Professor Pratima Murthy, the director of NIMHANS, Dr. Sanjeev Sinha, um, and all the team of neurologists, administrators, the IT, and so on, for making this uh, oration. Thank you very much. I feel deeply honored by the gesture of NIMHANS. Pamela, you can, you can call you Pam. Thank you very much. It was an extraordinary lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. Now, may I request our respected registrar to felicitate the orator and also to deliver the vote of thanks. Good afternoon, and uh, the oration delivered by Professor Pamela Shah is truly comprehensive. It has educated our understanding at multiple levels of neural organization. It may be at the genetic level, at the molecular level, at the cellular level, ultimately translating the research which has occurred at the basic research lab to the clinical trials and to the a successful outcome of the clinical trials in MLT. I'm very sure that she is the most respected neurologist and an excellent clinical researcher with a, a translational approach for incurable disease like MLT. The NIMHANS is truly honor the contribution of Dr. Pamela Shah for a significant contribution for the patient care and also the developing the newer therapeutic tools for treating the motor neural disease. Since we are not in person, I'm very sure that on behalf of the entire team of NIMHANS and on behalf of Professor M. Gauri Devi, we take this opportunity to thank you. I'm sure that in future, we'll have in-person meeting and we'll be very happy, Nimans will be very happy to host you. And I'm very sure that whatever the clinical contributions and also the basic research, which Professor M. Gauri Devi started at NIMHANS, with a clinical population of uh, Indian origin, 
looking into the multifaceted approaches for understanding the pathophysiology associated with motor neuron disease that led into various developments including development of biomarkers i am very sure that the approaches which both the distinguished neurologist and clinical the uh, the scientists which they have taken it has contributed significantly for our greater understanding of pathophysiology and also developing the treatment regimes for treating the the movement disorders but more specifically to the als or mnd i am very sure that since considering the pandemic situation we have large number of the online participants we thank each one of them to take part in this program i also take this opportunity to thank professor pratima murthy our beloved director who is always inspirational in various programs of the institute especially the academic programs we thank professor pratima murthy our beloved director for her leadership and also more importantly we thank professor f gauri devi she was a wonderful clinician great teacher extraordinary researcher and her leadership and mentoring huge number of students not only in the neurology but including the basic sciences is always remembered and appreciated and we are nimhans you know feels that the contribution of professor m gauri devi even after superannuation continued and her contribution to the neuroscience community is always appreciated and this is an opportunity for us to thank you and also to be part of the entire the growth of the institute and also witnessing a wonderful oration delivered by the pamela shah we also have very distinguished participants the online professor p satish chandra the former director of the mhas we have professor chali and we also have supil venkatesh from st john's and many other colleagues in india and abroad are witnessed be the part of this wonderful oration so on behalf of each of the participants on behalf of the faculty and the students we take this opportunity to thank profusely professor dhame pramila shah for a wonderful oration and the kind of the the education or the teaching which she has delivered and it is truly inspirational and i am very sure that the clinical trials which are in the different phases each one of them will translate into a wonderful tool of clinical treatment for the the mnd so i take this opportunity to thank once again the department of neurology and the entire imhans fraternity for witnessing a wonderful lecture delivered by professor pamela shah and also once again i thank professor gauri devi and also our below director professor pratima murthy and all the delegates who have attended this entire oration thank you very much jai hind namaskar thank you sir i once again thank all the respected invitees who have joined online now we will conclude the oration thank you